We're live. All right. Hello, everyone. And um, good afternoon. And uh, welcome to this meeting of the Committee of the Re Revision of the Penal Code, uh, which is now in session. I'm Mike Romano. I'm the committee chair. Uh, thank you for everyone joining today in the current circumstances and, of course, in this format. Um, I'd like to begin just by taking a quick roll call in alphabetical order. Uh, Senator Burton, who is not here. Uh, Judge, Judge Espinoza. I'm present. Uh, Assemblymember Kamlager. Here. Justice Moreno. You're on mute, Carlos. I see you. <laughs> We're going to mark him as here because I see him. Uh, Dean Richardson. I'm here. Great. And Senator Skinner is on the floor, but that still makes a quorum. Mike, she's actually here. Oh, great. We're lucky. Oh, hi, Senator. How are you? Good. You're here. Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, today's agenda has been distributed and is on our website, uh, but here's a quick preview. First, we will hear from uh, California's Director of Finance, Keely Bosler. After Director Bosler, there will be three panels of witnesses and experts who will address today's topic, which is short sentences of incarceration. Members of the public will have a chance for comment at the end of the panels. We expect comment to begin at around 4.30 p.m. When that time comes, I will explain how to line up for public comment in Zoom. Please do not do so now. We will also take quick five-minute breaks uh, along the way in between panels. Uh, first off, before we get started, uh, I want to briefly address the COVID-19 public health crisis and the social movement sparked by Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd killing. These have obviously affected the committee's work and I think all of our lives. Uh, in our capacities outside of the committee, several members and I have been working day and night with impacted communities, incarcerated people, lawmakers, prison officials, and the governor's office to address these emergencies. In many ways, I believe these are symptoms of the larger systemic problem our committee was formed to address, which is to develop reforms to the penal code that will improve fairness, unnecessary incarceration, and improve overall public safety outcomes. The committee itself will not directly address these issues of racial justice or the virus. Instead, we will keep on track, try to keep ahead of the daily news cycle, and around the, on the, around the curve towards long-term future of the state. The purpose of this committee is to develop reforms to California's penal code in a deliberative manner, informed by evidence and data, rather than politics and anecdote. We are directed by statute to make formal recommendations to the legislature and governor in January, and I intend those recommendations will be substantive, substantial, and practical. Those of us on the committee who are involved in the day-to-day -day urgent business of health crisis will continue to do so in our day jobs, so to speak. And I'm happy to discuss my work with any of you in a different forum. As a committee, however, I believe we best fulfill our legal duty and the interests of the state by concentrating on the systemic reforms that can withstand the test of time, improve fairness and justice in the long term, avoid conditions leading to crowding and health-related crisis, and staking, staying focused on evidence and data that can make California's criminal legal system the country's most humane and effective in terms of public safety in a post-COVID world. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood where we stood on that. Uh, now to the substance of today's hearing. Today's topic is short sentences of incarceration, which for day, today's purposes means jail and prison sentences of three years or less. This is actually a huge portion of California's incarcerated population and system of criminal laws. According to the most recent data, over 90% of convictions in California were for misdemeanors and low-level nonviolent felonies. Every year, 77% of people released from state prison had been there for three years or less. That's 30,000 people. People who commit these crimes have also have the highest recidivism rate. According to the latest CDCR data, the recidivism rates for petty theft, shoplifting, and simple drug possession are all over 55%. So something isn't working. Even though short sentences make up much of the system, they are not often the subject of sustained study. We hope to change that a little today and in the future. 
Today, we will hear about different outcomes from commitments to jail, prison, and probation. We'll also hear directly about what it's like to run and be confined in institutions where people are serving short sentences, including some of the practical realities of engaging in rehabilitative programming. I also expect that the committee will explore alternate creative solutions, including expanded the use of alternative custody programs like monitored community release. With that said, let's get off to the good start. Um, today, we'll first hear from California's Director of Finance, Keely Bosler. We're extremely grateful to hear from Director Bosler and for joining us during this busy and unpredictable time. The Department of Finance plays an extremely important but often under-heralded role in the administration of the criminal justice in California, particularly as corrections costs continue to climb as the overall population drops. No one understands and or appreciates the details of the criminal system and its place in the larger ecosystem of the state better than Director Bosler and her staff. We are very eager to hear from you today. Thank you for joining us. That is quite an introduction. I know, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but thank you. Um, um, it's very nice to see you all. Um, uh, my name is Keely Bosler, as uh, Chair Romano um, just introduced, and I'm currently the Director of Finance uh, uh, for the Governor. Um, but I actually spent earlier in my career quite a bit of time working on public safety and criminal justice policy. Um, in my time in the state legislature and e even spent a year working at the Department of Corrections and, and really understanding the challenges um, there. Uh, but one of the really, I think, um, interesting parts about my job and the place I sit is that I really do see the whole continuum um, of how all the different pieces uh, that the state funds in its, in its annual budget um, fit together. And one of the things that I think makes the criminal justice system particularly challenging is you have, you have a whole continuum um, of, of programs that really you could say start with preschool and K-12 education and higher education, but then continue um, to the courts, which are mainly state funded, but there's a county MOE and they're an independent branch of government. And then we've got the DA and the public defender, they're funded by the counties, probations funded by the counties, directed by the court, um, jails are, are, are run and funded by the counties, sheriff's departments run and funded by the counties, police chiefs and police departments are city funded. Um, and then prisons, which is really kind of, I, I see as in some ways, sort of the failure of all of these other systems. And I don't mean that in a really negative way, but if you end up in prison, you've really probably been through all of these different systems many times. Um, and, um, and then we fund the prison system at the state, at the state level. So when you're really looking to change public policy um, in the criminal justice space and really focus on public safety, you really have to traverse over different um, uh, jurisdictions from the state to the county um, and even to school districts. And so there's, there's a bit more of complexity um, as opposed to programs that are just primarily funded by the state. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think makes this area um, so interesting, but also a bit more complex. And, and there's been some really um, innovative things uh, and, and financing arrangements that have in the end um, really driven big changes in the criminal justice system. Um, and, I'm, and I'm gonna touch on some of those briefly um, today. But I did, I did bring a few slides. So I'm gonna share that up now. Can you see that, the, the line graph? Okay, okay, good. Um, so the first thing I wanted to start with um, uh, was just kind of to show some trends and, and, and what's driving costs um, and, and just show you what the costs are. Um, right now in our state prison system, it's about 80, a little over $83,000 uh, per year uh, to house an individual in our, our state prison system, our parole, costs are about $12,271 um, uh, per individual. And you know, as we're going through this really um, uh, you know, huge economic crisis, um, one that we haven't seen um, really 
in, in recent history um, at all with very high unemployment rates. And we are really just at the very beginning of it, I would, I would argue from a fiscal and budgetary perspective because revenues to the state always are lagging what's happening out in the world. And um, uh, so I'm, I'm really anticipating the next several budgets uh, to be very, very difficult and a lot of hard choices um, ahead. And we just finished a budget that had a lot of hard choices um, as well. Um, but uh, as we get into these scarce times, you get really focused on what levers you have to really control costs. And in the prison system, I would argue, it is an incredibly rigid system in which to try and reduce costs during bad times. There are very few levers because essentially in a prison, you're funding staff, you're funding facility maintenance costs. And a lot of times during recessions, you skip on that. And so you end up with some of the really um, uh, bad uh, deferred maintenance issues that have been well documented in our state prison system. You're funding programs like education and drug treatment. And then you're funding really the basics of health care and mental health services. And those are, those, those are all, uh, those are really the nuts and bolts of running the prison system. So the real way in which you reduce costs in our prison system is really by having fewer people come there. And that's, um, and that's obviously involves all the other pieces. Uh, when you're really focused on public safety, you really need to understand all those other pieces and how they can contribute to the end result being a reduced uh, prison population, because always the back end, the incarceration um, at the at the state level is 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 by far the most expensive um, uh, system that we have. Um, just a little bit about Proposition Fifty Seven, which I think is really interesting because I've worked on the state budget now for almost twenty years, and um, early on when I was working on the corrections budget, I will say that programs were a big piece of, of, um, uh, of budget savings uh, during those bad fiscal times. And now with Proposition 57, I think the dynamic has really, really shifted. And, and this year, it really came into focus for me when we were working through preparing the May revision. And because um, credits, good time credits, programmatic credits, are really um, tied to an offender actually being able to attend program. And I'm gonna set COVID aside. I will address COVID and what's happening in the prisons very briefly at the end of my presentation because it can't be ignored. It's, it's such a big, big issue right now. Um, but it's really quite elegant in terms of, you know, every time we take a program out of the state budget, we actually are increasing costs because that means less um, opportunity for um, offenders to attend programming and to earn those credits, which get them out of prison faster. So that's just a really, I think, elegant piece. I mean, not to mention the benefits of, of individuals actually engaging in programming and bettering themselves and, and getting prepared to enter uh, society with more skills and, and tools in which to um, move out of uh, uh, criminal activity. Um, I'm just going to go quickly to this slide. This is just, I put the juvenile justice costs on a different um, axis because um, this is just, uh, shows the, the costs at the Division of Juvenile Justice. Um, it's obviously um, a much more expensive uh, a system um, and one that the governor has actually proposed to um, radically change and, and um, realign uh, to local governments. Uh, but but right now we currently pay um, currently spend al almost three hundred thousand per ward um, at the Department of Ju Juvenile Justice and and those costs um, have increased um, uh, over the last several years. Um, this slide I thought was interesting. My staff put this together, but it just sort of shows an, an evolution a little bit further back, but. Um, you know, some of the cost drivers, um, and this is just specifically healthcare expenditures. And so obviously, um, healthcare and, and the class action lawsuits, uh, specifically Plata and Coleman, um, the, the, these two courts are very active in, in really determining um, how we operate our state prisons when it comes to healthcare and mental healthcare. 
and these these costs um, have been uh, significant um, that they that have been driven by these lawsuits and by the actions that they, they um, have in some cases dictated quite specifically and in some cases in more recent years when the, the, de the department has been starting to take over the health care from the receiver, um, uh, which is in the Plata lawsuit. I think I'm talking to a lot of experts here, so I don't want to <laughs> bring it down too much, but there's um, class action lawsuits have been a huge part of the, of the cost um, increases over time uh, and, uh, and have really uh, changed the landscape of the of the cost structure um, in our prisons, and um, you know the the work has, with the receiver has become you know very much more collaborative, and and the state has taken over control over many of the prisons, um, but there continues to be a lot of active uh, conversations with the court and new actions, and especially actually most recently um, related to to Plata. But this just kind of shows you how those costs have changed um, over time. Um, I want to just touch briefly on a few of the, the, the innovations or reforms that, that I see as really being significant over, over the last uh, a decade, uh, a little over a decade. Um, and uh, certainly um, even before SB 678, there was uh, uh, changes uh, to the Division of Juvenile Justice, which used to be the Youth Authority, um, that uh, required uh, counties to pay for the full cost of uh, the incarceration at the state facility. Um, and that, that itself shrank the DJJ population from um, around 10,000 wards. Um, ultimately, we are now um, at only 800. Um, awards at the state facility. So a really big transformation that happened over time and um, that I would argue was really driven uh, by fiscal incentives that the counties had uh, to build and um, address youth, uh, 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 youth offenders um, in their local communities and not at the state facility. Um, but 678 was another uh, big reform that happened right before uh, realignment. And I know you've probably spent some time really diving deep into both of these. So I'm just going to focus on the fiscal pieces. Um, but the idea here is, is the exact idea that I started this, this conversation, this presentation on about this continuum. I, I mean, the, I think the state saw value in investing more earlier on in the continuum of criminal justice and so in this, in this regard, in probation, in order to save money at the state level um, uh, in our prison system. And so that was the exact incentive that this was set up on. Obviously, a lot of cha things changed in the interim, um, but this is an important mechanism um, that was used and did result um, in savings, um, especially early on. Um, right now, the state currently dedicates about $112 million um, annually uh, to fund probation through the um, SB 678 uh, uh, program. Um, the other um, really massive change um, that I had the pleasure of, of working on uh, with many people uh, was, was 2011 public safety realignment. Um, this was a really big change uh, and uh, it, uh, it, it really changed the landscape of our state prisons. Um, it certainly uh, put a lot more money down into the counties uh, to support this, these populations. And I think it's really, you know, it, it'll be, I'm sure, a huge part of your conversation today about short-term offenders. Um, we were having such a difficult time in our state prisons uh, with many, many people coming there just for six month stays, seven month stays. And when you think about how many things that every time a new inmate is admitted into state prison, all of the health care and mental health uh, assessments and all of these different um, assessments on, on behavioral and, and programmatic needs, um, all of those costs, you know, were really gumming up our reception centers and making it very difficult. And I know there are people here from corrections that can speak much more eloquently um, than me 
on that issue, but it was really, really making the criminal, the, the prison system very, very difficult to manage with all of these short-term offenders that were in and out and not enough time to get them into really the programming that they needed uh, to get to. Um, so there was a, a realignment of certain crimes, uh, certain nonviolent, non-serious, non-sex offenders that had been previously sent to prison uh, were going to be uh, funded, uh, counties would be funded to address these offenders in their local communities. And, and, and the money was uh, uh, set aside for uh, these uh, CCP plans um, that uh, really, you know, looked different in every county. Uh, I think the prior governor uh, uh, that I used to work for, Governor Brown, he very focused on um, the fact that we were a huge state and that it's not going to look the same in every county. There are different needs, there are different populations, there are different problems. Um, and so giving some authority to the counties uh, and to these, these specific boards that includes, included the courts um, to really work through at a local level how to allocate resources to get the best outcomes. Um, this, this whole realignment, and I think sometimes people, and especially this year, because this year is the first year we're, we're, moving, back into, we're moving back into a time of, of declining revenues. Um, and realignment, we, really since 2011, we have been in this historic expansion and growth period that, that the nation and the state has been experiencing. Um, and so this year, uh, there were less sales tax. So when we did, we call it realignment, we actually dedicated a piece of the state sales tax to the counties, um, along with a piece of the, the vehicle license fee. So these are revenues that, you know, that they see the ups and they see the downs. And so this year, um, because of COVID and the recession that's associated with it, um, we are projecting um, pretty significant declines in sales tax uh, revenues. And, and to address that, um, actually the legislature and the governor um, did prioritize um, about 750 million of the state's general fund uh, to help support county uh, programs that are, that are funded uh, by realignment. Um, the overall realignment is worth about $7 billion, um, $2.3 billion uh, go to the, the more law enforcement um, related items. There's also um, child welfare um, and some other mental health programs um, that are also supported uh, by 2011 realignment. Um, but the real, I think, vision behind the CCP plan was that there would be a real conversation. And I'm sure that there's a lot of members on this committee and others that have opinions about how these have worked or not worked in certain areas. But the idea was that they would be able to really think through how to uh, make their system um, as effective as possible. Um, and, and obviously they have a much more power because they, they fund and run the continuum of mental health and healthcare and, um, uh, and uh, social services programs that so they would have an opportunity to allocate resources to get the best outcomes for, and, um, pub for public safety. Um, and so that's, uh, that was one of the things um, that, that really underpinned the why in terms of um, public safety realignment. Um, and obviously it had a massive effect. Um, this is just the actual adult population from July 2010 to July of 2020. And you can see um, there, there has been a significant decline uh, from where we were just 10 years ago um, in terms of who is um, coming to prison. It's changed the prison population um, uh, in terms of the makeup. Uh, but uh, um, it has also been, um, you know, a really important part of um, um, how the state has uh, continued to, to manage its budget as well. So to, right now, um, corrections is about $13.4 billion of the overall state general fund, and it's hovered around 9% of the state's general fund. Um, and that's actually uh, uh, mainly the reason why it's been able to stay at that, at that level is because of this continued decline 
uh, in uh, population because as you saw in the prior charts, the expenses in terms of health care and mental health care, um, expanded uh, programs, and then also obviously the correctional officer costs, that those are all things that have gone up and up and up in terms of overall costs. And so um, every year the per unit cost is generally going up. Um, and so the only way to keep that budget um, contained is really to be looking um, at ways in which uh, there, there will be fewer people served in prison. Um, and so the real, um, so that's, uh, uh, I just wanna give a little bit about that and just a little bit of context um, when I started working on corrections policy, um, I remember it was under Schwarzenegger and I was still working in the state legislature and we, we authorized those out of state contracts. And I never in my wildest uh, dreams would have thought those out of state private contracts in public in some cases would have, we would still have had those uh, this many years later. Um, but just last year, June of 2019, we were able to terminate the final out-of-state contract. Um, the final private in-state contract was terminated for men, was, contra uh, was terminated uh, this year uh, in May. And then all the other in-state public contracts outside of our state prison system um, are going to be um, uh, eliminated, uh, or planned to be eliminated this year. Obviously, COVID-19 is really, really um, upending and, and causing extraordinary issues. Um, and this year, the budget, uh, you know, was uh, the plan uh, based on population trends that will continue to be monitored um, is to close two brick and mortar prisons um, in the state. And that's, that's just a tremendous um, uh, thing for us to be doing, and uh, one in, starting in 21-22, and then the second in 22-23. Um, so just, I, this is a very dense slide, but I just wanted to talk about COVID-19. This is dominating uh, uh, the administration's um, efforts right now, not, not just in, in the prisons, but obviously um, through every um, area of, of the state budget and of, of government. Um, it's impacting all of us in, in its, own, its own ways. Uh, and it's certainly uh, been a very, very um, uh, important focus in our prisons, which um, obviously with infectious disease um, are very, very challenging places. And with this virus in particular, um, a really, really challenging place in terms of um, containing and stopping the spread. Um, some of the, these are some of the major actions um, that the administration is in the process of taking. taking. Um, we early on uh, did a short program of 60 day early releases. Um, we have also had to do a temporary stoppage of prison intake. Um, and that's been uh, lifted a couple times, but is back in place right now. Um, and there are also been um, 180 day early releases implemented um, uh, just this month and one year early releases at eight of our high risk um, institutions. And all of these um, things are, are being taken, uh, you know, very, very uh, targeted in terms of uh, which offenders and in, in an effort to really um, uh, uh, minimize the impact on, on the state's public safety and to take an evidence-based approach. And then the last two are the high-risk medical and hospice. Um, and just important to note, and I'm sure you've already talked about this in other sessions, just we do have very large um, elderly population and um, a, a population that are um, at risk. And so just really looking um, at how we can uh, reduce the spread and um, impact on that population within the state prison has also been a focus. Um, it's just, it's a huge challenge um, with, uh, you know, any one of our institutions with three to 4,000 inmates and is almost as many staff moving in and out of the institution. And there's just so many opportunities um, uh, for uh, the uh, virus to come into the institution and then once there to quickly spread. And that's, that's been really 
um, a, a big issue that we've been dealing with now for a couple of weeks at San Quentin, and we continue to have a really an incident command style um, operation to try and address that and get on top of that. Um, and that ins include um, a lot of extraordinary actions. Um, but I'm probably going to end there, and I'm happy to answer any questions now. And um, but I'm really, really was uh, very honored to be invited here and um, to talk about the fiscal perspectives of criminal justice reform and and just how important the work that you all are doing um, uh, to to make sure that we improve public safety, but also the um, ensure the effective deployment of the of, of state funding and state resources. Um, to, to do that. And that's, and that's really the big challenge and, and puzzle of, um, of uh, public policy in the criminal justice space. So I'm going to stop sharing there. Um, thank you so much, Keely. Um, and thank you also for extending to um, take a few questions from the, from the committee members. I'll just kick it off real quickly. Um, we heard from Professor Cheris Kubrin uh, last month about the public safety impact of realignment. Um, and I was wondering if the state had its own data on not just the fiscal impact, which you discussed, but of the public safety impact or consequences of the DJJ reforms, 678 realignment that you talked about that, that did have these dramatic changes. So do we know how things turned out in terms of public safety in regard to those? Um, I, I have seen studies, my, my office does not do those types of studies specifically, but I've certainly seen studies um, where uh, there has not been a correlation with increased crime um, and those, and those um, activities. So I, that, is, that is something that I think there has been a lot of studies about. Um, you know, obviously there are, a lot of, there are a lot of individuals that I think ended up staying in counties that have really complex mental health and substance use issues. Um, I think that one thing that was also done at a very similar timeline was the optional expansion in Medi-Cal, which is a really, really powerful and important thing that I think sometimes people disregard. But before that, indigent men did not have access to Medi-Cal um, and, and did not have access to basic health care. I mean, they, they had indigent health care, county clinics, absolutely. Um, but this is, this is, this is Medi-Cal, this is the full benefits. Um, also, the Affordable Care Act included the expansion of the substance use disorder benefit in a very, very meaningful way. Um, it used to be here in California that we really only funded methadone. And that was really a result of the lawsuit. Um, and so, you know, after the Affordable Care Act, we've been in the process, and it has been a process of expanding um, behavioral health services and substance use um, disorder services um, across the state. And that's really just a huge, huge advent is treating um, uh, addiction um, as a healthcare issue. Uh, and it's something that I think, um, you know, continues to evolve in this administration and has been really, really focused on the whole person care um, and really thinking about service delivery, especially for the homeless uh, and mentally ill populations that are often very involved in the criminal justice system as well. Um, it's just, it's a different, it requires different modalities to deliver care and to, um, address those issues. And I think we've made some good progress with the pilots, uh, the, the uh, whole person care pilots. And we were really looking forward to expanding that benefit statewide um, because of fiscal, uh, the fiscal situation. We ended up uh, just uh, continuing our waiver for an additional year, but it's something that we're very interested in, in seeing expanded uh, to assist this population. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's, I agree, it's very important. Do other committee members have questions? I do. Uh, Justice Moreno. Yeah, just uh, just two questions. Uh, first of all, thanks for your presentation. And I'm simply astounded as to the uh, annual cost per inmate at the $84,000. Uh, you know, there used to be uh, observation that it costs more to incarcerate someone than to send a kid to Harvard. And I think this proves the point. Uh, but my, my two questions are, what, what percentage of the budget is attributed towards staff, salaries, retirement, and so forth? And the second question is, 
what types of savings do you anticipate with respect to the closure uh, of the two prisons in the next uh, couple of years? Um, so those are good questions. So I mean, the the prison system, and I and I wish I I this will I need to get you the statistic back because I don't want to I don't want to guess. It's a very yeah. large percentage of staff yeah. costs, obviously. Yeah. Um, it is a, it is a people intensive business um, in terms of both custody and yeah. also all the healthcare and mental health care um, staff as well. So um, it's our by far our largest department in terms of personnel, um, and it's a huge driver um, of, of 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 costs as well. However. Yeah. For this year, obviously, because uh, negotiated with all of its labor unions, including the correctional officer union, uh, for a, a pay reduction. Yeah. Um, right. and so that that was something that that has been um, uh, uh, approved for this next coming two years. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, those uh, that was really important uh, in terms of our ability to manage the budget over the next few years. But I will get back to you with the specifics. Okay. I mean, um, just yeah, Bob, you, you often hear that it's the prison guards that are responsible for a lot of the staffing costs. And it, it just seems, the 84000 per year seems like really exorbitant, but I mean, it is what it is. It is what it yeah. is. Um, it is uh, a very difficult job. Um, and we, we definitely want to have a very professional organization. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there there's a, there's a lot of, um, uh, difficult, difficult work uh, that's required, but um, it is absolutely a people business, and uh, um, it's it's a, a lion's share of the cost. Um, what was your other question? I'm sorry. Yeah, related to the closing of the two. Uh, oh, the closing the of the two prisons. Yes, and, and I and I don't have those numbers at my fingertips oh. either, but it's 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 lever it's it's um, hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. um, over time. I mean, so the thing about the correction system and how you save money, and this is why there were several things that were proposed this year that are still pending in the legislature, but they didn't have immediate budgetary impacts. Yeah. The way in which we reduce costs um, in the correctional system, as I, as I said earlier, but still protecting public safety, there's a much longer arc. And so the closing of these two prisons is, is really something that probably, you know, started back in realignment. I mean, we're, we're, where yeah. as I explained all of these um, private facilities we had, these out of state beds, we had a, I call it a very big hole to dig out of in terms of how many inmates we had. And then we had the court order, like reducing overcrowding. And so we had really had to kind of spend a lot more money than we otherwise would have in terms of buying all of these private beds. And so we, we needed to get out of all of those. And so now we're finally at a population where we can live generally within our state prison system. Of course, COVID is really challenging yeah. that and requiring a lot of tents and other things um, uh, to do the, the, the distancing that we need to do to reduce the spread. Yeah. But, um, but uh, um, you know, the, the ability to close two prisons, and of course that really is dependent on the population trends continuing, um, is really something that has come not just from actions in the last year, but actions over the past decade that have really changed um, the, the population. Okay, you had mentioned the Including all the, the short-term offenders, which yeah. were really part of the um, but it, like uh, back when I used to do a lot more prison visiting, which was over 10 years ago, I definitely saw all those triple bunks on the day room floors. Like the yeah. prisons are a very different place now, um, right. which is really good because it was very, very hard to implement a rehabilitative environment in those overcrowded conditions. Right. Yeah, we're going to the same issue here in Los Angeles County with respect to... Uh, you know, changing from the men's central jail into a more sort of open, more rehabilitative approach as opposed to the old style level of confinement that you get in those dingy, dingy places. So that's just an observation. Yeah. Uh, there, and there's, there's obviously still so much more work to do in terms of, um, you know, staff training. Um, really, the, the name of the game is like, is having people that are, you know, serve their sentence and are released into 
um, society and are able to get along on their life, you know, not in the criminal world, um, yep. you know, be able to get a job, pay their bills and support their families. And so all of the different rehabilitative programs, but also the efforts I'm looking at both assembly member and senator here, they, they've been involved in, in um, different efforts to to yeah. um, reduce the stigma of hiring ex-offenders and also really reduce barriers that are real that the government has put in place sometimes right. um, to reduce barriers to um, uh, people being able to um, uh, move into a livelihood that can support themselves and their families. Um, so those are all of those training programs. You know, there's been a lot of efforts to work on um, the fire training, um, and also even doing some testing for janitorial uh, programs that the, that the state has. Um, all of those things are important um, to reducing uh, uh, recidivism and, and really improving public safety. And it's, and it's honestly so much harder to do once people have come to state prison. It's so much easier to be on the prevention um, side of things and um, uh, diversion. Uh, but once people do come to prison and we know people, there will continue to be people who come to prison. Um, you know, I think, you know, we want to do our best to, to use our money in ways that are effective in getting people um, uh, 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 ready to be released back into society with the tools that they can use to um, uh, get a job and support themselves. I agree. Uh, Assemblymember Comlogger and then Senator Skinner, I think you each had questions. Uh, yeah, so thank you. And thank you, Keely, for taking the time because I know you're incredibly busy um, trying to figure out how to keep our economy from cratering. Um, you did say, which thank you for saying, that it's important that we're helping folks who are getting released to get along with their life. And yet that can be really difficult when we see challenges in our parole and in our probation systems. You'd mentioned, um, you know, AB 109 dollars and then SB 678. And um, obviously I'm very interested in probation, but looking at a recent report that actually came out of LA County, they were talking about those dollars um, specific to uh, the juvenile space and also the adult space. Um, and $140 million of adult dollars and $25 million uh, juvenile dollars left on the table unspent, mm. SB 678 dollars. Mm. A litany of reasons why, from a um, arduous procurement process to just general in bureaucratic inefficiencies to culture. Um, and so how do we, you know, if part of it is about finding the money and then the other part of it is about being efficient with the mm. money. Yeah. And then a third part is sort of threading the needle between how you incentivize folks to do what they need to be doing and then how you punish folks who don't. Mm. Um, it's still, you know, it was disheartening for me to kind of read the report about mm. how the legislature has been asking folks and encouraging folks to do right. Um, and then all this money is on the table, which then is the reason why folks can come back and say, we have to keep these same laws on the books. We have to keep doing what we're doing. This isn't, you know, this isn't working. And mm -hmm. we always sort of look to the incarcerated person to say they're not doing what they're supposed to do mm -hmm. rather than being reflective and looking at the systems mm -hmm. and saying, okay, system, where are you failing? Yeah. So as we're sort of talking about dollars and it costing 83000 per inmate adult, mm -hmm. You said 300,000 per ward for juvies, which is yeah. like, are you kidding me? And we're not reopening our schools, but that's mm -hmm. another Zoom I know. Um, <laughs> you know, how, how can we be helpful? And what are your thoughts on how we can, you know, thread the fiscal needle mm -hmm. as it relates to not just shortening sentences, but allowing for a quicker kind of pass through through the system because mm -hmm. we're leaving dollars on the table that could be helpful for this early releases are happening at a snail's pace and then we still have prisons that are over capacity and there's obviously a will to make some of these changes and there's a desire to not waste as much money as we are wasting in this correctional system 
on yeah, top no, of I think we, I mean, I think there's a very good package of um, um, actions that uh, are still pending that we're going to get back to in a, in a week or so here um, that we're in the public safety trailer bill. I'm definitely looking at um, uh, the, the realignment over time. It wouldn't just be all on one day that we would transfer 800 uh, individuals back to, to counties, but over time to add the, the attrition of um, um, moving uh, juvenile offenders back to, to counties um, with, uh, with an array of, um, of appropriate uh, uh, um, um, places for people in treatment facilities, um, especially because there's such a, the, the, most of the state's population are there for very serious um, crimes or mental health issues or sex offenders. Um, and so really making sure that we have the array of facilities um, and, and resources that are needed by the counties, um, but, but giving, giving the counties more opportunities to design a continuum and program. I mean, I, I know years ago, I remember learning that, that Santa Clara's um, dependency and juvenile systems were, were integrated, their court systems. I think that is a really progressive way uh, to be, you know, thinking about youth um, and all of their different complicating histories and then being able to design the treatment program that really, um, you know, supports their uh, behavioral needs and their, and their histories. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking about how, you know, counties do, do have, have so much, um, they are so, in, so very much the, 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 the the primary deliverer of um, social services um, uh, in the state, and and really, um, you know, can support that continuum um, through design. But um, it definitely, um, I think, uh, requires lots of uh, conversations. Um, there are other efforts um, I know in our in that, that were in our May revision, some of which were added to through the legislative budget processes, and and I think we have a, a good package of changes that will help. Uh, to um, uh, reduce the parole tail uh, uh, for a lot of offenders uh, to make it uh, very uh, much more aligned and in, in alignment with best practices. Um, as you said, um, that one size fits all has not necessarily served us well from a deployment of resources effectively. Um, and so I think that's a really big and good change that is also pending um, in the legislature as well. So I think the governor put forward um, quite a few um, important actions. I think there were some additional ones. There were definitely some additional ones added by the legislature that we also support in terms of um, some ad additional um, uh, um, elderly uh, and uh, uh, parole um, efforts. And so that those I think are um, some really good additional steps um, that will be helpful uh, to the state. Thank, Thank you. you. I do want to say counties don't operate in a vacuum. They operate in conjunction with judicial officers and DAs. Right, right, so absolutely. It's inappropriate for us to think that one part of the equation is going to be the solution. Right, right, right. Senator Skinner? Mute. You're From mute. Thanks. Um, I do have a few questions, uh, Keely, but uh, and also you can um, send uh, Judge Moreno any updated on this. But as because I'm the budget chair of the subcommittee that deals with yes, the, you probably have the answers, and I, I don't. Mean, oh gosh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> don't worry, the area I have to. So um, the personnel which includes all the benefits everything is about is between 66 to 68 percent yeah of the uh total cost but the health care is uh 28 to 30 percent mm -hmm. so that shows you how little of it is for anything else right um, but the health care right. is that is the section as much as yes we focus on the um you know say the prison guard costs the largest portion that is rising each year is the health care costs. Right. That has been Absolutely. the most significant. And the important thing to think about, and this is, you know, kind of in our other context rather than our short sentence discussion, though clearly, all right, why it's relevant is if we can get it, if we can fix this, 
you know, early end short sense thing, maybe we aren't putting as many people in prison, but mm. the point being the healthcare costs, just like the overall public, mm -hmm. the lion's share yeah. of that huge, you know, that it's over 3 billion, I forget, it's about, it's, it's a very significant portion of the CDCR total budget is the healthcare, meaning dental, mental health. Yeah. And of that, it's a handful of incarcerated individuals. It's a small yeah. percent, mm -hmm. just the same way all the healthcare costs across the uh, population are a small percent. It's the right. older, the very old elderly, which we have a lot of, and then people with the most um, chronic long-term conditions. But anyway, we'll leave that alone. Um, but it's all very real, and it's been shocking to me how much it's going up. So the more we can get the older uh, incarcerated individuals out, then the more we can reduce mm -hmm. our costs, even more than closing a prison. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, Keely, you legitimately described the county, uh, the jails being a cost to the county. Um, but as you pointed out, under realignment, <clears throat> we did realignment, which of course, increase that population the jails mm -hmm. and the state does fund the realignment portion so can you give me a sense this one i should know but i can't remember yeah no i look i just i did look that up um before i i came in here um and so the the law enforcement section of, so overall realignment it's down because sales tax is down but it's it's Seven billion. It's around seven billion, but it's been much higher than that in recent years. Um, Two point three billion are those traditional law enforcement categories, which included the the amount of money that was the proxy for the offenders that were no longer serving in state prison that were going to serve locally. Um, I think that the idea around the CCP was that you know at the time it, you know it wasn't it was not expected that they would just fund jail, that they would fund some array or some continuum of program of, of programs that address the needs of this population that was being that was realigned that. Um, and so some of those, I think I, I, I haven't studied this since you you've probably done a lot more investigating of this in more recent years. Some counties, I think, have done um, a very good job with their CCPs. Um, and again, it's more than just the county, it's the judicial um, uh, representatives as well. Um, and have thought very um, system, you know, with a systems approach about how they can, you know, address the issues of these, of this, of these individuals, whether it be drug treatment or mental health. Um, and then others probably kind of set in motion a plan and then it became became more difficult to change it over time. Um, and so that's that's I think probably where where that is. But I, I haven't I haven't um, myself personally investigated it recently, but we something to be investigated. So we don't so I guess it's um, I don't we don't have the total cost uh, that jails represent to each county. Oh, how much? Yeah. Well, I mean, because it was it was not a dictate. Right. Um, I don't. I don't personally have it, but I. I it's probably available in those reports. I, I and it does VSCC potentially has has that yeah, information and probably and probably does, because I know that the the CCPs are required to do annual reports. Um, but, you know, I mean, I remember following my own local here in Sacramento and, and kind of understanding like early on, they opened a wing of the jail with, with that money. Um, at the time I was like, oh, that wasn't exactly what we were envisioning. <laughs> um, but, you know, that, you know, kind of, I think that, you know, I think that the idea behind those was that there would be this local conversation about how to best deploy those resources is to to maximize public safety um, to improve public safety um, and that's that's really long-term reduction in recidivism so incarceration is not always the answer um, uh, and so that was the, the idea is that you'd have different voices at that table uh, and um, you know I, I would like to do have more time to investigate what's what's been happening there um, but I think that's really um, uh, 
you know, the progressivity of, of having this, these issues resolved um, at the lowest possible level is that you can actually put more resources into prevention more easily um, than you can when you when you fund a prison system. It's, you know, it's like everybody wants to like take that money and put it at higher ed. But I mean, the, the costs, you know, how we talked about are quite rigid when you have people in the prison, you have this array of costs that are not really very flexible. So, um, but, uh, you know, the counties that have a whole continuum of, of services and, and um, programs that they could design and, and deploy to help address the, these populations and their behaviors um, are, are, you know, really powerful in terms of getting different outcomes. So um, I don't, I appreciate that, um, those answers. And Mike, I don't really have other questions, though I think what, um, what Keeley just described, I think this is, it's why well, I think it's very important that we are having this conversation because we know that um, the, uh, what's the word? Um, I don't want to, outcome, it, it, each county is different. Mm -hmm. We have counties that send us a lot of folks to state prison. We have counties that have, um, you know, really vary in their programming within the jails. We have, it, it's not uniform. Now, of course, it's not 100% uniform in the state prisons either, either mm -hmm. but it's a little more. There's mm -hmm. a little more ability. You know, we, we have the credits program, which is across the board, whether mm -hmm. all get access to the same kind of programming is different, but there is much more, um, much more variance within the county jail system. So mm -hmm. our ability to, um, to try to uh, improve outcomes there, it's not hampered, it's just that it, it's just a different approach. And yeah. I think it's really worth having the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, well, thank you. I'm going to just uh, cut it, cut off this part of the conversation now because we're running a bit behind. Thank you so much, Director. Yeah, Bob. no, thank you. I mean, it was a pleasure to get to talk about the subject. Usually, I'm talking about deficits and uh, um, that sort of thing. So it was really um, a, a great pleasure to be here. And thank you for all of the important work you're doing here at this committee. And and, and vice versa, especially in these times. I'm going to take you up on your offer also to keep in touch. Um, I think we're particularly interested in um, some of the financial incentives um, mm -hmm. to improve uh, public safety outcomes and uh, use of public safety resources. Um, as Senator Skinner said, we are very, very interested in the details of the data. Uh, I have, I'll have an update about data uh, tomorrow. That, you know, so that's something that we're really trying to get a hold of and we're obviously happy to to share um, and also appreciate your perspective that this is sort of an ecosystem. And as you said, you know, that it traverses so many different jurisdictions mm -hmm. and departments and counties and levels of government that trying to get a hold of and really make things better is, is a really difficult task. And, you know, in some ways you're sitting with a bird's eye view of, of all of it. So again, thank you uh, so very much. I really appreciate it. It's a challenge and it's an opportunity and it's, it's, uh, it's really um, important, so. Agreed. Uh, I promise we'll be in touch. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, um, so thanks to everyone. Um, we obviously went long with uh, Director Bosler, but I thought that that was uh, worth our time and her time. Um, so I'm gonna move right ahead to our first panel 